carefully. Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up. Look at this, causing trouble. That's what bitterness does. It causes trouble. It stirs up trouble. It stirs up strife. It stirs up division. Be quiet in here this evening. When someone's bitter in the group or someone's bitter in the Bible study, they have a tendency to get other people upset. Bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And it says, and by this, many are defiled. What happened to Naomi? What was the cause of Naomi's bitterness? What's the cause of some people's bitterness in the house of the Lord? Naomi became bitter because of sudden loss. In, in the story, you can read it in chapter one. Famine had took the life of her husband and her two sons. And she was left alone with her two daughter-in-laws. I don't know if she was sad because she didn't like her daughter-in-laws. But to be without a man in the house was very difficult in those times. Sudden death, sudden loss. Look at this, sudden change. See, it's not always death that leaves us bitter. Sometimes it's a quick change. Sometimes a, a friend that you had is no longer your friend. Even a girlfriend, she dumps you on the party line. She don't like you no more. She found, she found a new man. Sudden change. It's not always death. <laughs> Sometimes it's loss, sudden loss. Something happened quickly. You, you thought your life was going this way. And then the twinkling of an eye, it was shifted this way. Suddenly, you had a suddenly moment, but it wasn't a suddenly of God. And, it's, and when you go through those moments of sudden loss and sudden change, it's like a shock to your system. It's a shock. The, the rapid loss of a friendship, a family member, a, a life change. It can be overwhelming even for the strongest Christian. Don't think for a moment that it's just the new believers that struggle with these things. Understand that quite often it's the people that have been serving the Lord a little while. In fact, people who've been serving the Lord a little while, a long time, they haven't been through it once. They haven't been through it twice. Some of them have been through those seasons five and six times. But thank God that through it all, they didn't let bitterness grab them. They didn't let bitterness take hold of them. They're still serving in the house of the Lord with joy. They're still backing up the vision, backing up the things of God. Come on, somebody. Even the strongest person has to guard their heart against bitterness. When you go through a sudden change and a sudden loss, it's a shock to the system. And it causes someone to go into crisis mode or into survival mode. How many know at least one person right now who they've lost their joy. They've lost their passion for ministry. They've lost their passion for church. They've lost, even some of them, you used to follow them, whether from up close or from a distance, but you could see that little by little, because of change and situations in their life, they've lost their passion. And it's difficult for you to follow them because you could see that something's wrong with their walk. Something's wrong with their leadership. Something's wrong with their spirit. They're hurt over the history. They're hurt over the pain. Let me tell you something about change and sudden loss. It will test your faith. Sudden change will test your faith. Sudden loss will test your faith. If you ever wanted to test whether you believe God to be God in your life, go through sudden change. Go through sudden loss because it's in that moment where you're going to discover whether you're a real disciple or not. How many think I ought to preach this thing? How many feel like this is from the Lord tonight? Bitterness will test your faith. And if you're not careful, that bitterness will weigh you down. It'll weigh you down in the house of God. Once you were lifting your hands, worshiping, now you don't lift your hands anymore. Once you were early at the altar, now you come in late. You trickle in late. You see, I have other things to do. I have other interests. It's not that, it's not that you're... Not interested, it's that you're hurt. 
you're bitter, you're angry, you're carrying something that you need to leave at the altar tonight. Bitterness. When we look at Naomi, we find that bitterness defiles, bitterness deceives, bitterness depresses. And what bitterness wants to do, catch this, if you catch anything tonight, bitterness wants to change your name. Bitterness wants to change your identity. Bitterness is Satan's playground. When a Christian or a leader falls into a season of bitterness, that's when the devil gets excited. He says, oh, yeah. Now I can, now, now I can mess with their mind. Now I can mess with their, what they believe. Now I can mess with their relationships. Now I can let a little bit of doubt come in and let a little bit of fear come in. Come on, somebody. Dr. Jesus is in the house tonight. That's the devil's playground. See, and if you want to be everything God's called you to be and you want to reach your full potential and you want to serve the Lord more than a year, then you've got to win this war in three battlegrounds. You've got to win the war of the mind. You've got to win the war of self. Jesus is not always doing an outer work, but sometimes he's doing an inner work. He's doing an inner work in you. He's doing an inner work in your leadership. You've got to win that, 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 that battle of the mind. You've got to deal with that stinking thinking. You've got to deal with that fear. You've got to deal with that self-sabotage. You gotta win this war on three battlegrounds. You, you gotta win the war of relationships, the war in the church. Listen, <laughs> understand, man, when you come to church, there's a battle in this room. Don't you know there's a battle in this room? Don't look at your neighbor, because I know you're mad at them. That's why you sit here and they sit over there and come on, you don't talk in the hallway. There's a battle in church sometimes. Can we be real? But when you're losing the war in your mind, you're going to lose the war in the church. We, we've got to learn to overcome relational obstacles. We've got to learn to forgive those that have seemingly done us wrong. We've got to learn how to forget about it. And then you've got to win, you've got to win that war not only in your mind and that war in the church, but you, you need to win that war in the world. You got to stop compromising. Can I preach to my church about sin? Stop compromising. Stop letting down your guard and lowering your standards for your coworkers. Come on, somebody. Stop lowering your standard. You, at one time, you were on fire for the Lord. At one time, you wouldn't let one thing defile your walk with God. I mean, you would even turn the TV off if a bad commercial came on. But now you've just let it all hang out. And you've taken liberty and you've abused your liberty and abused the grace of God. And then you wonder why you're dry and you wonder why you can't praise and you wonder why you don't want to serve. And you want, oh, I want to tell you something. Stop sinning and start winning. Stop compromising with the world. Stop compromising your values. Stop trying to be like every. Well, I'm just trying to identify. Yes, but now you carry the identity. You look like the devil. You look like the world. We're not called to blend in. We're called to stand out. We've been anointed by God. Care how much money your boss makes, you still have more than him. I don't care what kind of house he lives in or what kind of car he drives or who he's dating. you got the power of God. You have the Holy Spirit. You have conviction. You have values. You have principles. Say we're going to win the war. See, the good news is that if you're dealing with bitterness, Jesus destroyed bitterness at the cross of Calvary. But before we deal with bitterness tonight... We've got to understand it. Naomi became bitter. Her circumstances made her bitter. Her situation made her bitter. The quick change in her life made her bitter. And, and the first thing we see is that it, bitterness defiles. Someone say it defiles. This is so heavy, so powerful. 
when you read this. It says, when Naomi returned to Bethlehem, look at here. The city was excited to see her. Imagine that. When she showed up back home, everybody was excited to see her. I think about people that they leave the church and they go back to the world. And everybody wants to hear about what God did in your life, but you don't have anything to share. She comes back, and they're so excited to see her, and she makes this profound statement about her identity. She said to them, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Notice this, is that the people, they never changed their view of her. But it was Naomi who had changed her view of herself. That's what bitterness will do to you. It'll cause for you to forget who Christ created you to be. While the whole world is waiting, whew, is waiting to see the goodness of God and hear those stories of victory and Rejoice with you over your wins. She came in. She said, don't call me Naomi. Her, her name, Naomi, meant sweet. The literal definition of Naomi means my sweet. My sweet. Just like if you have a daughter and you would call, her, call your little girl my sweet. What, what a precious way to refer to somebody. My sweet. But Naomi no longer wanted to be called that. She wanted to be called Mara, which means bitter, which means bitter. Think about this for a moment. She went from being a sweet young woman to a bitter old lady. And, and ladies, don't get mad at me because it happens to guys too. <laughs> One time she was so sweet, so enjoyable to be around. Things were so promising. But her trials changed her. Where did this word bitter come from? It, it came from the book of Exodus when the people of God were delivered from Egypt. They were very thirsty. And they came to a spring of water where they desired to have a drink. But what happened is they became angry with Moses because the waters at Marah, they could not be drank. They couldn't, he, they couldn't drink them because they were polluted. They referred to them as being bitter. And they called that place Mara because the water was useless. It was polluted. And you know what they did? They, they grumbled and they complained against their leader, against Moses. They said, why did you bring us here to die? You know what happens when someone be, becomes bitter? They, they become defiled. And what happens is that at one time, life was flowing out of them. But now... Nothing but anger and resentment and blame. Is this too strong? It flows out of them. Bitterness flows out of them. I got a question. What's flowing out of you? Now, you look good here, but when you leave this place, what's flowing out of you? You can fake me out, but you can't fake God out. You can fake me out, but you can't fake those people you hang out with. They know what you talk about. They know... When you're eating, the thing, hmm, things that come out of your mouth. Because bitterness always flows out in our speech. It also flows out in sarcasm. I was reading a book, an old revival book from the 50s, and this writer said, sarcasm is the most quiet and subtle form of pride. When you're talking to somebody and they just have a sarcastic remark about the church or a sarcastic remark about something good that's happening. They said that's one of the most subtle forms of pride. What's flowing out of you? What, what's, flowing, what, 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 what's flowing out of the, your heart? That's why the Bible says guard your heart because what's in you, it's going to flow out. What's in you is going to flow out. What happened is that these people were bitter. Naomi became bitter, and she allowed her wounds to transform her into something she was not supposed to be. I want to close this point by telling you, don't let it happen. 
Don't you dare let it happen to you. Don't be that guy. Don't be that bitter girl. Don't be that bitter leader. Don't be that bitter church. Well, you don't know what happened to me. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. Don't, don't carry that bitterness any longer. Well, you don't know what. Listen, we all been through stuff. Let it go. Let go and let God. See, the true power of this Christian walk, young believers, the true power of this Christian walk is that we don't have to let our history determine our destiny. If it's in the past, it's under the blood. You've been forgiven. They've been forgiven. Come on. I know it hurt, but it's over. Keep moving forward. Don't get polluted. Don't get defiled. Don't. Come on, somebody. Clap if you believe that that's the way forward. That's the way to new levels. That's the way up the mountain. Come on, somebody. I'm ready to climb. I'm ready to go higher. I'm not going to let bitterness hold me down and trouble hold me down and hardship hold me down. Bitterness defiles. The second thing, as I brought out already, is that bitterness deceives. It deceives. Someone who's walking in bitterness has been deceived by the enemy. The Bible teaches that. That's why we've got to be careful that we don't let hurt and anger and unforgiveness take control of our life. Because somebody who's walking in bitterness and anger, they've been deceived by the enemy. Look at what Naomi said. She, she blamed God. She says, the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. The Almighty, God, did this to me. That's what some people say. God did this to me. God made me sick. God took my spouse. God took my position in the church. God hurt me. No, God didn't hurt you. You know what hurt you? Life hurt you. Life hurt you. In this life, you will have trouble. That's what Jesus said. In this life, you will have trouble. He says, but be of good cheer. I love you so much. I overcame the world. You don't have to live bitterly. Bitterness deceives us. See, Naomi blamed God for her loss. And this is a common reaction when difficulty and loss come our way. If you're feeling that way, it's not strange. I've been there. I've been there where I've been hurting and I've gone through trouble, personal trouble. I've dealt with all types of trouble and trials and treachery. I've been through all the T's, <laughs> trials and trouble. I got knives in my back and in my front. And you got to understand that sometimes life is hard. Sometimes when you go through trouble and you go through problems and you go through situations, don't count it strange. We've all been through that stuff. Even the Apostle Paul had trouble in his life. How many respect that man of God? Every time you open up the word, you hear of the trials and the trouble that he faced in spreading this gospel around the world. And, 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 and in the book, he, he mentions about a, a thorn in the flesh. He talks about having a thorn in the flesh, doesn't he? And he talks about how he had this thorn in the flesh, and three times he pled with the Lord to remove it. He said, Lord, take it away. Three times. Someone say three times. That, that says something to us because we all have something we need God to heal. Every person in this room has something. I don't care how good you look on the outside. We all have something we need God to heal. And, there, and every one of us has cried out to God. Yeah. Have, isn't it true? Yeah. We've cried out to God, and we've even given God ultimatums. It's God, if you don't do it, I'm going to leave the church. <laughs> and he doesn't remove it. He keeps that thorn right there on the side of your flesh. And so we start fasting. Oh, God, I'm going to fast so that this thing can be broken. And it stays there. We've begged God. We've fasted before God. So what did Paul do after he prayed and fasted and pled with God to remove the thorn? And God kept that thorn right there. Paul flipped it. 
He said, Lord, if you're going to leave this trial here, it must be for a reason. There must be something that you're trying to do in my life. Mm. So you won't get a lot of claps on this because you want to hear about blessing all the time. But I'm trying to take you to another level. He flipped it and he says, okay, God, I've pled, I've fasted, I've begged you to take it away. It's still here and you're not removing it. So you must have it there for a reason. You must be using that to break me. You must be using that to deal with me. You must be using that to keep me dependent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rejoice in my affliction. I'm going to give you praise and glory that even though this thing should have took me out, I'm still here. I'm still doing what you call me to do. I may not be talking to everybody, but I'm talking to somebody that you've been through some stuff and now you realize that God allowed you to go through it. Tell your neighbor, God allowed it. Paul said, God, even if you don't show up and remove it, I'm still going to serve you. I'm still going to serve you. <laughs> my worst day as a Christian is a thousand times better than my best day as a sinner. My worst day in the house of God is a million times better than my best day in the nightclub, my best day in the drug house, my best day in that broken room. My worst day in the house of the Lord is a million times better than what I experienced when I was doing good in the world. Somebody give him praise right now. I'm almost done. Give him praise. See, if God doesn't fix your situation, don't get bitter. Understand that there's a situation. There's something that God's trying to bring out of your life. If he allowed it, he allowed it for a reason. And he's allowing it. He's allowing you to go through that trial and I get the feeling it's because he's trying to use that trial to grow you. But know, know this is that whatever God allows, watch this. He's going to sanctify it. He's going to redeem it. And he's going to use it for his glory. <laughs> I might preach, be preaching over some of your heads today. But who's hitting, who's, who says this is hitting my heart? Who says, this is hitting my heart. Let me tell you that if he allowed it and he left it there, that thorn, that pain, woo, even if it was just to keep you on your knees, even if it was just to keep you humble, then you better believe that one day you're going to be testifying about how God got glory how God got glory out of your situation. So what am I saying to you, man? Don't get bitter because if God gave it to you, that means he can trust you with it. He's not going to give you anything you can't handle. I know you've been through some heavy storms just like me, through cancer, through heartbreak, through death, but you're still here because God says you can handle it. I can trust you with it, and I'm going to turn that test into a testimony, and I'm going to turn that mess into a message. And I'm going to turn that trial into a triumph for other people. And that's why you can't get bitter. That's why you can't get bitter. You want to know why? Someone say, why, Pastor? You can't get bitter because somebody's watching you. The whole city rejoiced. To see Naomi, but she failed the test. Woo. She didn't realize that there was a whole city watching her. <laughs> there's a whole city watching you. Tell you, there's a whole city watching you. I was thinking about trees the other day. You know, you can never really get a, an accurate measure on a tree while it's going up. Why? Because it's always growing. It's not until that tree is cut down and falls. It's not until that tree is cut down and falls that you can get an accurate measurement of what kind of tree that was. 
How many trees have fallen because of bitterness? How many trees one time were standing so tall in the house of God and they felt like they weren't making an impact and nobody was watching them and nobody cared about what they were doing. And bitterness took them down and hurt took them down and trials took them down. And then you went to measure them and, you re- and, th- and it was there that people realized, man, they really were making a difference. I wish they had known it while they were alive. I wish they had known it. And you know what happens when a leader falls? You know what happens when a believer falls? They don't fall alone. They never fall alone. They never leave the church alone. They always take people down with them. Every time. Come on, leader, wake up. Come on, brother and sister, wake up now. I love you. I'm trying to tell you the truth here. Come on. Come on, somebody. I know the devil's trying to lie to you, but don't give up. Don't get bitter. Don't throw in the towel. Stay in the fight. Somebody's watching you. Somebody's depending on you. This is good stuff. And then bitterness will depress you if you allow it to. Stay there too long. When tragedy strikes, when disappointment sets in, that's when the enemy wants to make you depressed and keep you depressed. And when people become depressed, they become real vulnerable to the enemy. Now, I'm here to talk about depression because I understand what it is. I come out of depression. I remember when I was a young boy, my head used to tingle like little little uh, pins. I've bit my fingernails my whole life. Tried to break the habit. Why? Because of depression and anxiety. I've struggled with that my whole life. I know what it feels like to be in depression and to deal with anxiety and have inner battles. Am I in the right room? But I've learned one thing is that when you're going through depression, you better be careful because that's when the enemy shows up. That's when Leaders and Christians, instead of running to the altar, they run to the world. Misdirected grief. Instead of running to the altar, they run to the liquor store. They run to those old friends and they know they got the bag. And they don't go to get high. They're intense not to get high. But just let me just get around. And if they pass the duchy on the left-hand side, I'm going to just go ahead and keep on, take my hit and pass it. <laughs> Somebody too young for that. And that's when Christians, when they're in depression too long, they start, instead of taking the right steps to get healthy and coming to the altar or talking to their leader or talking to their Bible study and say, listen, I'm, I'm a, the enemy's trying to attack my emotions and attack me spiritually. And yes, the enemy will play with your mind. And he will come with lies. He's the father of all lies. And he woke up. But instead of going to your leader and being open and honest, and saying, this is what I'm going through, this is what I'm experiencing, this is what I'm dealing, they run and they start medicating themselves going and diagnosing themselves and doing things that take them out of the will of God, making dumb decisions. Well, I should do this. And they start making all the wrong decisions. Is this this hitting too close to the bone? And I can tell you as someone who has dealt with depression and dealt with anxiety and been under pressure and been through all types of different things in my life with my children and my family and I know what it is to feel all by myself I have determined in my life and determined in my leadership that no matter what I do I'm going to remain an example I'm going to remain an example I may not be perfect but I'm going to strive to be an example to my church an example to my family an example to my community I don't understand how pastors could drink and then preach how leaders could sing God's praises on Sunday but they're sipping on Saturday night 
How, what kind of example is that? How are we going to build a powerful church with leaders that are constantly making excuses and compromising and living like the world? There's no power in that. That's just performance. We need men and women that no matter what you go through, you're going to solve, oh, man. You're going to be an example. don't need to get drunk on wine. I'm drunk in the spirit. I'm drunk on the Holy Ghost. My cup is overflowing with the oil and the glory of God. Is that, we could edit that. Go ahead and edit that off the video, man, because that's not popular these days. A lot of Christians, instead of running to the altar, they run to the bar. They run to the nightclub. They run to the gas lamp. They run from one relationship to another. But I've determined that I'm going to be an example to my generation. I'm going to be an example to the church. As they come. Woo! Come on, Victory Outreach. Who's with me? Come on, Victory Outreach. Who's with me, man? Who believes God's got some big things for our leadership and for our life? Woo. That's why you can't get bitter. That's why you can't get bitter. I don't need the Holy Ghost or something extra. I might need a Tylenol every now and then. Stop following the world. Stop following those co-workers that call themselves Christians and they're partying on the weekend. Stop, stop trying to make money and get famous and do all. Man, you, man you're going, you're, all you're going to do is get bitter. Because you got to step on so many people to get up to that level. By the time you get there, you ain't got nobody to celebrate with. You don't want to hear your pastor today. Be humble. Don't get bitter. Don't get angry. Don't hold grudges against people. God didn't hold a grudge against you. Didn't he, did he forgive you? Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying that. I'm not. My wife's not perfect. Pastor Miller's not perfect. He looks perfect, but he's not perfect. Touch your neighbor and tell them, I'm, I'm not perfect. Look at, stand with me. Touch your neighbor and tell them, I'm not perfect. You guys can come up. I'm not perfect, but watch this. But, but my intentions are pure. I'm not perfect, but my intentions are pure towards you. <laughs> my intentions are pure. Not perfect, but my intentions are pure. Tell your neighbor, I'm not perfect, but my intentions are pure. And that's what the Lord looks at. He weighs the heart. Man looks at the outer appearance, but God looks at what? That's why the Bible says, protect your heart. Guard your heart. Take care of your heart. Let him heal your heart. work in you because Jesus defeated bitterness one of the most powerful things is when he was on that cross right and they tried to numb his pain and they put a sponge dipped it in vinegar and, and it's a whole thing put it on a stick and tried to get him to drink and he refused it because the last thing Jesus wanted to taste on his way out was bitterness That's why if you're bitter, that's why if you're bitter, you should never leave the church. Because that's the last thing you'll taste. You'll forget all of the altar calls, all of the times of rejoicing. You talk to those people that left. They're, they just talk about the bad times, but they never talk about the good time. They never talk about how many people went to their kids' birthday parties. They never talk about how many people blessed them. They, they just took the sponge. Oh, come on, somebody. 
they, they don't talk about the world conferences they went to. They don't talk about the mission fields that they hit. They don't talk. You ain't hearing me in this place. All they talk about is the bitterness and the pain. But Jesus says, I don't want that sponge. I'm not going out bitter. I'm not going out bitter. I'm going out better. I'm going out higher. I'm going out fuller. Don't take the sponge. Tell neighbor, don't take the sponge. And Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't know the mistake they're making. They don't know that they're coming against the son of the living God. Don't get bitter. Get stronger. Get better. Come out of that trial, Naomi. Come out of that storm, Paul. Come on, somebody. I am victory outreach. I am victory outreach. Lift your hands all over this place. Jesus. Talk to him all over this place. He's going to heal hearts at this altar. Oh, you're coming out of bitterness tonight. You're coming out of her. I know you've been wounded, but you're coming out. He's about to heal you. He's about to break you through. Don't take the sponge. Say, no, no, no. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, I know that you've got a plan for me. I know that you have a plan for me. I know that you've called me. I know that you've used me in the past. You've anointed me in the past. I know that I'm like that tree that has made an impact. I know that you have used my life and you're not done with me yet. There's still more that you want to use me to do. And if you feel you need to be at this halter, you say, Pastor, I need healing. I need to turn my heart over to God at the altar again. And I need that fresh oil on my heart. And I need some wounds bandage. I want you to come. Don't be ashamed. I'm right there with you. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Come down to that altar and say, God. Come on, if you're watching online, make this altar call with us.
city. Heal us that we might lead our city to victory. Heal us, God. Heal us, God. Heal us, God. Minister and music. People are broken all over this altar. Come on, Roger, let them use you right now. Let them heal you right now. You're coming out of this. You're coming out of it right now. He's healing you of those deep wounds, family wounds, abuse, trouble, unfair judgments against you broken relationships people talked about you try to ruin your name but God says I got your back I've got a plan for you come on it's a new season for you he says I'm pulling you out and I'm bringing you into my promise come on that's it too many people are dependent on you brother too many people are dependent on you sister come on they're watching you the whole city's rejoicing when they hear your name. The whole city's rejoicing when they hear what the Lord has done in your life. The whole city's rejoicing. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. what I want you to do. I want you to look for a brother or a sister, maybe two, at the altar anywhere, and I want you to pray for one another. God is releasing healing in this church. What, what's happening right now is going to begin to permeate this whole church. What's happening on this night, this Wednesday night, is going to be released in such great measure that when people walk into the house on Sunday, they're going to be they're going to feel something they never felt before. Come on, I want you to join with a brother or sister. Someone join with Yolanda here. This is a, you didn't get bitter. Yolanda, you didn't get bitter. You have the joy. The Lord is with you. Come on, Naomi. Sweet, sweet daughter, sweet sister. Come on, that's right. Make circles, pray for one another, lift one another up. Someone join. Don't be alone. Nobody alone. Come on. Everybody, come on. Get, get with somebody right now. Healing. Healing. Strength. Come on. He's giving you a new heart. Renew a right spirit in me, O oh Lord. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Come on, right now. Jesus, Jesus. Let, let those tears flow. Let those tears flow. That's it, Roger. Let those tears flow. Come on, you made it. You're going to be okay. Oh, consume me in fire. Purify my heart. Purify my heart in the flame. And fill me new, yeah. Fill me Yeah. 
have been shifted tonight the territory of the heart has been taken tonight thank you Jesus come on I want you just to lift your hands in this moment say this prayer to me say father seal your word protect this fire I don't want to grow bitter. I want to grow better for everything that you have for me, for my family, for my calling, for everything you've called me to do. Keep my heart pure. Make me into a David that I may have a heart after you. thank him in this room thank him thank him thank him thank him come on just take a moment and thank him some of you feel lighter some of you walked in feeling so heavy and weighed down some of you had something in you for years but it's been broken tonight some of you had something in your heart for a long time but who feels like man I just got a breakthrough I got something taken off of me that's been there. Come on, praise him if he has done something in your life tonight. Hey. Thank you, Jesus. Tell your neighbor, you look better. You look good tonight. Did God move tonight? Don't miss Wednesday nights. 
some of you have been coming you've been checking it out let me tell you something something special is happening on wednesday nights here in victory Arch, san diego it just feels like a wave of momentum but how many know with waves of momentum there's a little bit of a swell taking place underneath a current taking place and they're stirring in the atmosphere amen and tonight wow can we give our pastor a hand tonight for that awesome on time word And what a beautiful, beautiful service tonight. Listen, we want to invite you back. Tell your neighbor, Sunday is going to be special because it's Pentecost Sunday this Sunday. Come on, give the Lord a praise for that. Is there anybody that's been dipped in fire? Is there anybody that's on fire for the Lord tonight? And your room just got, a, your heart just got a little bit bigger. The old things that needed to get out are out. Come on, somebody. So listen, don't miss Sunday morning. It's going to be powerful, powerful. Invite a friend, invite a family member. We're expecting a move of God this entire week. We got Code Red. We have Sunday night, Lions Breed University. Listen, Victory Arch San Diego, are you on fire tonight? Is God moving in your life? So listen, don't miss out. Also, keep in prayer the cafe. How many of you love what's going on in the cafe? We're seeing the, we're seeing the progress happen. So God bless you. We're going to see you this weekend. Go ahead and be blessed.